Plants in the interior bring the beauty and lushness of nature into our homes and offices and shopping centers. Hello, I'm Charlie Sacamano. People love this kind of environment. They respond to it in a very positive way. Unfortunately, plants don't always respond positively to being brought inside. They can develop problems. Like people, plants can fall prey to diseases or insect pests. This program is designed to help you diagnose what's wrong when problems occur. Equally important, we'll cover some recommended treatment to deal with specific problems should they pop up. Experience, more than anything else, is our most effective diagnostic tool. A good diagnostic procedure is thorough and systematic and begins with the knowledge of what a normal healthy plant of each species or cultivar looks like. Then, when there's a slight change in plant appearance, a noticeable effect of the disorder, called a symptom, we should notice it right away. And that early detection is critical to taking care of problems before they really become serious. With experience comes another kind of knowledge, that in certain situations there are certain things to look for, or that certain plants are susceptible to this or that problem. A careful investigation of plant disorders involves a two-step approach. One is a methodical, close-up examination of the plant. The other, which is equally important, could be called the stand back and have a look at the big picture approach. One thing you want to know is if the problem exists on just one plant, on one species of plant, or on a number of unrelated plants in the same area. Work up a case history of environmental conditions, such as light, temperature, and so forth. In volume three of this series, we've covered those basic plant growth requirements and explained what plants need for good health and appearance in the interior scape. Go back over those needs carefully as you check such things as the plant container and soil characteristics, cultural practices such as watering and fertilization, pest control measures, or the use of any other material, such as leaf cleaner, for example. Any of these might cause a problem, or as more often happens, two or more factors interact to create or at least encourage a problem. For example, hot, dry conditions in a growing environment encourage a buildup of two-spotted spider mites. One fertile female of this pesky mite can produce over one million offspring in 30 days with temperatures at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Another example, high fertility levels and excessively dry soil conditions can intensify problems with soluble salts, which can be very damaging and cause lots of problems with tropicals in the interior scape. There are a few tools that will be helpful in reaching an accurate diagnosis of plant problems. Now, these include a light meter, a thermometer, a 10 to 20 power magnifying glass, a sharp knife and hand pruning shears, a hygrometer, a solute bridge, and a hand pH meter. Interior landscape plants should be inspected often, perhaps weekly, to pinpoint problems before serious damage occurs. In the close-up examination of plants, carefully check buds, unfolding leaves, and leaf axles, as well as upper leaf surfaces and stems. White flies congregate on lower leaf surfaces, but you may find scale insects on upper or lower leaf surfaces or on stems. Mealybugs attack all parts of the plant, including roots, but they're often found clustered on stem tips and new growth. The cause of a problem might be in the container or growing medium, so remove the affected plant from the pot and inspect the root system and the medium in which it grows. Now, obviously, you can't do this with a large plant unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it is possible with smaller plants. Root problems may be your most difficult to diagnose because above-ground symptoms common with root problems, 
such as brown leaf margins or tips, chlorosis or leaf drop, are fairly general and could be symptoms of a number of other problems. Another important point is that symptoms of plant disorders may vary somewhat from plant species to plant species. And finally, let's not lose sight of one well-documented fact. Many, if not most of the plant problems that you're going to see in the interior landscape are the result of cultural or environmental mismanagement rather than insect pests or diseases. So the obvious solution has to do with changing your cultural practices or the plant's environment to produce a healthier result. Once you've carefully evaluated the symptoms of, or the disorder and have a case history of plant care practices and environmental conditions, you can begin to narrow the field of possible causes to those that seem most likely in a particular situation. Now, if you can't positively identify the cause, consult with an outside expert or try corrective measures for the most likely possibilities one by one until the problem disappears or the plant simply reaches a point where it has to be replaced. Sure, it's a hit and miss approach, but in the real world, sometimes that's all you can do. Whole volumes have been written about plant problem diagnosis. It would be impossible to cover all of this information in one program. What we'd like to do is show you some of the most common problems along with some of the possible causes. Notice a change in leaf color, general yellowing or chlorosis. Problem could be light levels that are either too high or too low, excessively high air temperatures, or even nitrogen deficiency. Are young leaves chlorotic? Could be caused by deficiency of iron or manganese, occasionally copper or zinc deficiency, or even a phytotoxic response to pesticides. Yellow spots of variable size and irregular shape on leaves? Several possible causes. Cold water injury, virus or virus-like organisms, fungal or bacterial infection, phytotoxic response to pesticides or fertilizer, air pollutants, leaf miner injury, or light intensity that's too high. Regular or usually round spots on the leaves, often a sign of infection by fungi or bacteria, phytotoxic response to pesticides, fertilizers or air pollutants. Do variegated leaves change to green? Check for low light intensity or excessively high fertilization rates. Could also be a genetic change or that the light levels are too low. Find a mosaic or new color pattern? Well, possibly virus infection, cold water injury, or phytotoxic response to pesticides. Do the leaves show a speckled or generally stippled pattern? The first thing to check for is spider mites or thrips. Does an area of leaf tissue have a water-soaked or greasy appearance? Could be an early symptom of high or low temperature injury, bacterial or fungal infection, even foliar nematodes. Now here's a common problem. Leaf margins or tips turn brown. Check for high soil salinity, high or low temperature injury, low relative humidity, inadequate water supply, pesticide phytotoxicity, feeding of spider mites, high levels of soil boron or fluorine in the water. Another very common problem with tropicals, brown dead areas within leaf blades. Well, this is symptomatic of fungal or bacterial infection, cold water injury, leaf miners, phytotoxic response to pesticides or fertilizers, or foliar nematodes. Are the leaf margins brown, or are there brown areas within the leaf blade? The problem could be too much cold air ducted onto the plant, water damage, or phytotoxic response to pesticide or fertilizer. Is the plant dropping leaves excessively? This is a common symptom when highlight plants are moved into low light locations without being acclimatized first. It could also signal high soil salinity or either too much or too little water. This kind of response is common with a sudden move to a new location with drastically different environmental conditions. Notice unusual holes in the foliage? Most likely this is damage caused by the feeding of insects, slugs, or snails. Does the plant have a grayish-white powdery coating? This is a fairly sure sign of powdery mildew. 
Signs of clear, sticky residue indicate honeydew deposited by mealybugs, aphids, greenhouse whitefly, and some species of scale insects. If you see a black, velvety residue, it's generally a sign of sooty mold fungus, which grows on honeydew deposited by insects. If the residue you see on leaves is greenish, then you're likely seeing algal growth in those situations where moisture is abundant. Use your magnifying glass to check for particular insects. For example, soft or armored scale are small, immobile, legless insects covered with a circular or oval convex shell. They have sucking mouth parts and are found attached to leaves or other plant surfaces. And they're usually brown, black, or gray in color. The citrus mealybug appears as white cottony masses. They're soft-bodied, sap-sucking insects. You'll find them most commonly on new growth, but they can also be present on other plant parts, including the roots. Two-spotted spider mites make their presence known by fine silky webbing on leaves or stems. And the leaves often take on a stippled, silvery, or dusty appearance. The greenhouse whitefly is a tiny white insect which flies from plant leaves when disturbed. It sucks plant sap, leaving sticky deposits of honeydew, often on lower leaf surfaces. Thrips are tiny, wingless, or winged insects with rasping mouth parts. They attack tender young plant parts, leaving them distorted, often silvery flecked, with small black droplets of fecal material on heavily infested surfaces. Using chemicals in interior situations to control insect pests has to be done with extreme caution. The first step is to read the label because the label is going to tell you exactly which pests this material is effective against. It'll tell you how to use it as well as what precautions you're to follow. Now, failure to follow those directions, failure to follow those precautions can result in injury not only to the plant but also to yourself. So always read the label follow the directions and the precautions. There are almost as many different plant disease symptoms as there are plants. It wouldn't be possible to cover them all in this program. If you encounter a symptom that you're not familiar with, consult your local plant supplier or any number of commercially available publications on the subject. You know, people who live near the ocean know all about soluble salt problems. But we have soluble salt problems in the interior landscape, too. Look at the sides of this pot. This white powdery buildup along the sides of the container is a sure sign of a buildup of soluble salts. The problem is so common, it deserves special mention. And the causes are many. Using poor quality, salty irrigation water, especially water high in magnesium, calcium, and chlorides and carbonates excessive rate or frequency of fertilization, poor drainage and aeration of the growing medium, improper watering, not applying enough at each irrigation to moisten the entire soil mass with a little excess flow out through the container drainage hole, or allowing a container to stand in drainage water so that the salts are reabsorbed into the growing medium. A high level of soluble salts in the growing medium reduces water absorption by plant roots. And in extreme cases, water actually moves out of the roots and back into the growing medium. Symptoms of the problem include stunted growth, foliage wilt, even when the soil is moist, leaves that first become chlorotic, then turn brown at the tips and along the margins. Symptoms often appear first near the top of the plant and progress downward. Now, avoiding soluble salt problems involves some simple, common-sense guidelines that should become part of your regular plant care routine. Use good quality water for irrigation. Avoid over-fertilization. Don't kill your plants with kindness. Use growing media that have good drainage and aeration characteristics. Apply enough water at each irrigation to flush soluble salts down and out dispose of excess drainage water. If there's a known potential for a salt problem, don't let the soil dry excessively. Also, you can prevent most serious soluble salt problems by having a commercial lab make periodic checks on the growing medium salinity, 
or do this yourself with a solu bridge. Leaching can help correct an existing soluble salt problem, but it can succeed only if the growing medium is well drained. You'll need to water thoroughly four or five times with a half hour wait between irrigations. Be sure and drain excess water between irrigations. If too much fertilizer has been applied and can still be seen on the soil surface, or if soluble salts have built up to form a whitish crust on the soil surface, scrape away the material and surface layer of the growing medium. Self-watering pots, and there are many new models commercially available, provide plants with a more uniform supply of moisture and avoid the problem of excessive drying between irrigations. Now it's time to talk about pruning and grooming. Why do we prune interior landscape plants? The same reasons we prune outdoor landscape plants. To direct growth, to control size, shape, and density, to maintain health and appearance, and to repair damage. There are basically three types of pruning with woody interior landscape plants. The first involves cutting a terminal back to a side bud, or removing a terminal back to a side branch that can assume the role of being a terminal. The third type of pruning is actually a series of three cuts, and it's a type of pruning that you'll need if you're pruning branches that are larger than an inch in diameter. In other words, for the most part, you're going to be using this with interior landscape trees such as ficus. Now, the first cut in this series of three begins on the lower side of the branch and the branch is cut into the point that the saw binds. This is out just a short distance, perhaps two or three inches out from the trunk. The second cut is made outside that first cut and on the upper side. This is going to remove the branch, the most of the weight of the branch, without stripping bark down the side of the trunk. We're left now with a short stub that we need to remove and that is done by making a saw cut just outside this little swollen area that we refer to as the collar ridge. Making the final cut at that point promotes healing and decreases the chance that decay may enter into the plant. The two pruning techniques for woody interior landscape plants are called hitting back and thinning out. Now, let's discuss each one of these. Hitting back involves cutting to a lateral bud or to a lateral branch or to a stub. Now the response to this kind of pruning is that the buds in the area of the pruning cut are going to grow most rapidly. There won't be much growth from below that. This growth is very vigorous, it's very upright, and it's weakly attached. It is usually so dense that if there is any growth down here, it's going to be shaded out. That's heading back. Now the second type of pruning technique is called thinning or thinning out. It involves pruning terminals back to a, a lateral branch. Uh, in some cases, pruning out small lateral branches at their point of origin. And the plant response to this type of pruning is that it becomes more open, but most importantly, it retains its natural appearance. And for most interior scape plants, this is the preferred technique of pruning. Frequent light pruning is less drastic, less noticeable, and therefore more desirable than infrequent heavy pruning. Since interior landscape plants generally grow slower and less dense than in a production area, they recover more slowly from severe pruning. Grooming is a practice that's very important to keep foliage plants looking their best, but it also has to do with their appearance. Keeping plant foliage free of dust and other particulate matter is important both to their health and appearance. Leaf pores, or stomates, are tiny openings in the leaves through which there is an exchange of gases between plants and the atmosphere. Dust and other deposits that clog stomates interfere with important physiological processes, such as photosynthesis and respiration. Dust also seriously reduces the light that reaches plant foliage. When dusty plants are cleaned, they not only look more attractive, but often show increased vigor. 
Cleaning plant foliage also removes mites, thrips, mealybugs, aphids, and scale crawlers in the eggs of these pests, as well as honeydew and sooty mold deposits. The need to clean plant foliage depends on air quality. The more suspended material there is in the air, the more frequently plant foliage is going to need to be cleaned. Generally, the interval will vary between once each week to once a month. Cleaning techniques vary with leaf characteristics. If the plant has large foliage, each leaf should be washed separately, wiping both surfaces clean with a damp cloth or sponge. Support one side of the leaf with your hand while cleaning the other. Newly emerged and young expanding leaves are often too delicate to clean in this way. These can be cleaned with a fine spray of water. Shake off any droplets of water that remain on the leaves to prevent spotting. Plants with finely divided foliage can't be cleaned in the same way without a certain amount of mechanical damage. A fine spray of room temperature water over the leaves will remove dust, lint, and other accumulations. Leaves with a corrugated, irregular surface are best cleaned with a fine spray of water or a soft brush. A soft brush is also best for cleaning hairy-leaved plants like African violet or velvet plant. The diagnosis and treatment of plant problems is probably one of the greatest challenges facing the interior landscape profession. Just remember, there's no substitute for management by walking around so that you can detect and treat those problems as soon as they appear. We hope our program will help you do just that. I'm Charlie Sacramento. Good luck.